Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Remy Rosenbaum, and I'm the VP Marketing at Caserta. I'll be your host for today. At Caserta, we're helping leaders like you who are looking to gain competitive advantage for their companies and to improve their process operational efficiencies, innovate by and through their data. We provide strategic consulting, advanced architecture, and implementation across the full data ecosystem. Our data and analytics services are design-led and framework-based, which greatly reduce time to delivery and improve accuracy and impact of the outcomes. Unlike technology-led solutions, our services combine both strategic advisory and technology to align business needs with proven and emerging solutions that drive targeted business outcomes. Our uncompromising dedication to finding the right answer to our clients' tough data challenges while ensuring the fastest time to value is a hallmark of our firm. Our projects incorporate emerging technologies and the latest in design patterns and innovative solutions through modern data engineering. Caserta's complimentary webinars by industry experts like today are designed to give you insight into today's hottest technological trends and issues. After the webinar, you're encouraged to contact us with any questions on how to apply what you've learned today at your firm. Following the completion of the webinar, a recording of the presentation will be sent to the email address you provided. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them in the questions panel on the right and we'll answer them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. In today's webinar, you'll learn how artificial intelligence is transforming the financial services industry right now. Today, we're joined by Wayne Eckerson, the founder and principal consultant of the Eckerson Group. Wayne, let's get started. Thanks, Remy. It's great to be here with you and everyone on the line. So uh, the topic uh, today is uh, AI for financial services, Remy said. Um, hold on one second, I got some alerts on my screen. Okay. Uh, AI for financial services, man versus machine intelligence. Um, and AI uh, is an acronym here, and uh, I'd like to challenge you to think about what that actually means. It could mean one of three things, and part of this presentation is discuss which is the right one. It could mean uh, artificial intelligence, could mean augmented intelligence, could mean autonomous intelligence. Uh, so we will we will find out what all those things mean as we go through. Um, and uh, I'm still getting more alerts, so I apologize <clears throat> if you can see those. Um, uh, so one of the things that people have been talking about with AI is that's going to replace whole swaths of jobs from truck drivers to radiologists, even artists and poets. You know, robots uh, work 24 by 7, they never get tired, and they make fewer mistakes than humans. So everyone should be worried that they're coming after your job, whether you're a blue collar farmer or truck driver to a white collar lawyer or radiologist. Uh, and some of the predictions we've seen out there is that AI will replace 6% of jobs in the US in the next five years. And of those jobs, according to a uh, January 2017 article in Fast Company, the top three jobs were in the financial services industry. Uh, those being underwriters and claims representatives, bank tellers and representatives, and financial analysts. But I don't have such a gloom and doom perspective on AI, however we define it. Uh, I think it's just another tool, um, and another tool that will help automate certain things and make our lives easier and more productive uh, in our personal lives as well as in our work lives. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you look back on the history of automation, you'll know that a lot of jobs have been automated out of existence, but they've been replaced with many other jobs. Uh, we no longer have people who make buggy whips. <laughs> we no longer have gas station attendants hardly, but yet we still have full employment. There are a lot of jobs out there to be had, uh, and many still go unfilled. Uh, so with that as a backdrop, let's dive into this topic. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's define artificial intelligence. It's really a machine that displays uh, intelligence normally associated with a human being, such as visual perception, speech, dialogue, learning, uh, and or decision making. 
And there's a thing called the Turing test, which was developed by Alan Turing in 1950, uh, that um, is kind of still today seen as the, the arbiter of, of machine intelligence or artificial intelligence. And that test is where a person uh, communicates with both a machine and another human being via text, and they can't see either. And if the person, the evaluator, can't distinguish between the machine and the human with whom he's conversing, then that machine is deemed to be considered uh, displaying human intelligence. And I still think that's a pretty relevant test even today. Uh, and the thing is that we've come a long way and we do have machines that can do uh, the things that I've listed here. Uh, but AI has been around for quite a while. Um, and what's interesting about AI is that the bar gets raised. What we may have considered AI back in the 70s with a computer graphical interface with trash cans and desktops and, and documents, uh, now we don't consider AI anymore. Uh, if, if you um, focus to the future and we look at autonomous vehicles, that's something that I'm sure everyone for quite a while will think is uh, 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 symptomatic of artificial intelligence. So the goal, kind of as I was saying earlier, really of, of all uh, of these advances and the use of AI really is for convenience. It's really for automation, it's to save time, save money, save effort, make our working lives more productive, make our personal lives more satisfactory. And I'm gonna stick with that line for a while until I'm proved different. So we also have to ask what is driving AI in general, not just in the financial services industry? Well, there's three things that I see. One is that we've got all kinds of data now that we never used to have, big data, variable data, high velocity data, the more data, the better you can predict things using uh, these algorithms that, that fuel artificial intelligence. We also have much larger processing power. Our computers with um, graphical processing units and uh, in-memory, which is now affordable at uh, scale, uh, enables us to, to mine this big data at speeds that were unfathomable uh, even a few years ago. Also, we have machine-based algorithms. We've always had algorithms. You know, statistic statisticians used to do these kinds of predictions uh, using pen and paper uh, and small sets of data. And if they had a larger set, they would sample it. But now we have algorithms that were designed to be processed at scale by computers. So that's a big difference. Uh, and finally, I think our businesses are ready for this. Uh, one, if you've been in the business intelligence industry like I have for the last 25 years, you know we've pretty much aced business intelligence, the use of reports and analysis. Now we want to move on and use information, use data to make informed decisions about what's going to happen uh, and be prescriptive in how we act. I also think that business is starting to see artificial intelligence and data science as a competitive lever that they can use in the marketplace uh, against their rivals or to disrupt entirely new industries. Uh, so if you look at uh, this chart from McKinsey, uh, they've plotted uh, the demand for AI uh, over the next three years. And uh, this was done last year. Uh, you can see that the leading sectors are financial services and high tech and communications. So uh, you in the financial services industry are probably immersed in all things AI and trying to sort out what this means for you. So one of the big challenges with AI or data science or machine learning, whatever you wanna call that, and we'll talk about technical definitions in a second, is figuring out what's the right use case for it. How do what do we apply this to? Uh, it takes you know high paid folks typically to to generate these uh, models, these analytical models. Uh, so we want to use them uh, carefully and selectively. Well, I think there's a very simple recipe. Uh, one, you you need a use case that has a lot of data, and not just any data, deep data. And by deep data, uh, my colleague Steve Smith has recently written is 
is data that um, is clean because you don't want garbage because garbage in is garbage out, uh, even in AI. Uh, and you want data that's not homogenous. You need data from multiple different sources, the more the better uh, to throw in this kind of witch's brew. Uh, the more variable the data, uh, the more likely you'll uh, discover patterns. Uh, the second thing you need is a, is a real business constraint. Uh, you may, for instance, want to run a marketing campaign, uh, but you only have $100,000 to run it. So that means you can't possibly address all of your audience with that. So who are the best folks in your uh, database to send this marketing message to? Um, you may have a constraint of people. Uh, you may be a social service agency uh, who's... Um, uh, workers are tracking down people who are delinquent on their alimony payment. So what, uh, you know, which people should you go after because you only have so many social workers at hand? Uh, time might be a constraint uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, a constraint that's real and defined is also a huge opportunity. So if you can overcome that constraint with AI, uh, you're likely to optimize a process that has been sub-optimized for a long time. And the final thing is that when you look at the process that you're trying to optimize, how standard is it? Uh, the more standard, the better, because that means you'll have uh, data that you can use um, to create a model that's highly accurate. The more variable the process, uh, the less likely you'll have uh, a high degree of accuracy in your model. And then finally, you need the right business and technical know-how to combine all these things along with the, the algorithms um, to, to drive a, a solution that delivers value to the business. So in the insurance industry, uh, um, uh, McKinsey again has uh, mapped uh, different uh, lines of business, different products in the insurance industry by their degree of standardization uh, against their potential uh, opportunity or the impact. Uh, and you can see here that workers' comp rises to the top, followed by auto and, and property. So artificial intelligence is a big tent. There's uh, many different types of artificial intelligence. Uh, truthfully, uh, rules, Boolean rules, if then else, uh, uh, can help simulate computer intelligence. Uh, so, for instance, uh, expert systems that we've had for a long time uh, to sift through a problem, come up with an answer. Uh, something that's pretty big in financial services now is robotic process automation. Essentially, it's a glorified screen scraper uh, that can mimic human activity. Um, and also something that we're seeing out there uh, uh, that gen automatically generates text. Uh, in response to uh, when given a data set. So it's called natural language generation. Certainly looks like uh, a human wrote this and, and some companies are using natural language generation to write financial reports. Uh, but really when you, un you get under the hood of these tools, they're really just rules engines uh, with a little bit of AI to create synonyms and make sure that your tenses are, are correct. Um, the next part of artificial intelligence, the next big swath is machine learning. Uh, that's where we have algorithms that were designed to be processed on uh, computers. Uh, and the most common type until now has been supervised learning. That's where you train uh, a, a model on a set of historical data with the answers given. So if you wanna run a promotion, um, uh, to reduce attrition, you would give it a set of uh, historical data of companies or people that have tried it in the past. So it basically, you give it the test with all the answers on it, and then you train the model that way. So you use a training data set that's labeled with the answers, and you apply uh, a variety of uh, um, data science techniques like classification or re regression or specific algorithms like decision trees to create your model. 
unsupervised learning is growing in influence. Uh, that's when we don't train the data. We just give it an unlabeled data set. And there are certain algorithms uh, that will go and find patterns in the data automatically. And those usually are clustering algorithms, segmentation, and anomaly detection. Uh, and then we have this whole other swath of AI, which I think is really captivating folks right now and generating some of the more innovative solutions in the market, uh, which we're calling deep learning. Uh, the first technique is generally known as artificial neural networks. Uh, that's a specific type of algorithm that mimics the neural pathways in the brain, it has multiple layers that you wait, and uh, it kind of does this magic under the covers and no one really knows how it does what it does and how it comes up with uh, its output. But companies and people are using this with great effect uh, to support natural language processing and image recognition. Uh, two other techniques that are getting a lot of attention now are generative adversarial networks or GANs, uh, where you essentially have two competing neural networks. One is trying to create a, uh, a fraudulent image or view of something, and the other is trying to guess the forgery. Um, and uh, basically, it's a self-learning, unsupervised technique that is resulting in uh, the creation of realistic photos and videos. Uh, this is a little bit scary to me because uh, if we think we have uh, fake news now, once we have the insertion of uh, realistic photos and videos that were generated by computers, um, it's gonna be hard to really sort out fact from fiction. Um, the final thing that's gotten a lot of uh, uh, acclamation is reinforcement learning. That's where you have these uh, self-learning agents that are given a, a reward uh, and a very confined environment. Um, so they learn uh, the rules of the road, as you, uh, if you will, as they go. Uh, it's using Markov decision processes. It's common in operations research to, to, to optimize processes. And this is the technique that um, Google's used to defeat uh, the top AlphaGo player. And, and this is a case where the algorithm learned how to play AlphaGo which is a very complex game popular in Asia, uh, in less than four hours, and then went out and beat the world reigning champion. So that shows the power of that technique. Uh, however, in a gaming environment with very constrained rules, um, uh, you know, this, this is where this type of technique can be very successful. In the real world, which is very, very messy and changing all the time, uh, it will have, um, maybe more limited application. Um, and, you know, I think that really is the, the thing with uh, artificial intelligence, what we used to call data mining. It can be really, really powerful in a very narrow and limited domain. The techniques we're using are getting more sophisticated over time so that they can understand the domain, ever larger domains, ever variable domains, and they can learn as they go along. But they're still pretty restricted in what they can do outside of those domains. So what will be the evolution of intelligence and financial services? I see it going through three stages. Uh, the first is automated processes, uh, then augmented intelligence, and then aut autonomous intelligence. And we can call all of these three things artificial intelligence. But automated processes, which some people call automated intelligence, really is just automating something that already exists, not necessarily with uh, algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms, but you could say automatic teller machines um, are an example of an automated process, as well as RPCs and even mobile claims processing where we're using technology uh, to automate certain um, manual uh, processes. Now, the companies that make ATMs like Diabold are saying that the, the A and ATM in the future will be A, <laughs> referred to AI, so AI teller machines that will be able to do everything, almost everything that a bank teller could do, you know, from, from processing transactions, which they do now, to uh, approving loans. 
So that's where automated processes and even robotic process control, which is now being called uh, intelligent process control as they're adding machine learning algorithms to it, it's gonna be moving up the stack. So augmented intelligence, we've actually had for a while in financial services. We use it in fraud detection, cybersecurity, risk management, where the machines really do the heavy lifting of trying to spot uh, anomalies, especially in fraud detection or cybersecurity. Uh, when they reach a certain threshold, um, they will be passed off typically to a human to evaluate and, and, and dig into deeper. So that's where a human and a machine work collaboratively to come up with an optimal solution. And then autonomous intelligence, as you can imagine, is where the machine does all the work and, and a human never gets involved. So we kind of already do this with automatic training. Uh, we're moving in this direction with automated underwriting in the insurance field, uh, where for specific classes of uh, policyholders, we can come up with a premium without any human involvement. And that's why you sometimes see these ads for, you know, you know people who can run uh, under a seven minute mile are going to be guaranteed uh, a, a policy with a premium under a certain amount of money. <laughs> And then, of course, we have robo-advisors in the wealth management space. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them on the next slides. So when we look at man versus machine, I kind of already hinted at, at where I feel this is all going. But machines are actually really good at making operational decisions, decisions that are fairly repetitive in nature, that happen time and time again, for which we can generate large volumes of data and model that process pretty exactly. Uh, whereas humans are really pretty good at strategic decisions where there's lots of complex variables where things change all the time, the process is not really standard, and we have to uh, take into consideration all kinds of exceptions as well as the future. So where I see this going is that the machines will do the heavy lifting and generate initial insights and the humans will then take that output. Uh, and if they understand the process, their domain, they may notice that there are some exceptions to the rule that the machine couldn't possibly have known, uh, and they'll tweak the output, or they'll just validate it as, as accurate. Uh, so I've seen that happen in a number of organizations. Kelly Blue Book is one where they brought in a statistical team to help the analysts create the, the values of uh, new and used cars. Uh, initially, the animals were very threatened by uh, the existence of statisticians and using uh, these machine learning models. But eventually, they began to rely on that output, uh, simply validate it, uh, sometimes override it. Uh, it didn't change their job. They were still responsible for publishing that number. But it made them hugely more productive. Instead of publishing one number a month for a certain number of make and model of cars, they can now publish uh, numbers for uh, order of magnitude, more makes and models uh, every week. So um, they've come to rely on as a tool to make them more productive and effective at what they do. So to optimize decision making, I personally think you need both. So let's talk about robo advisors. I, I think it's the same deal here. You know, robo advisors are pretty good at doing some of the heavy lifting. Uh, in a large wealth management company, they might uh, send out automatically uh, bulk personalized emails after a market correction to all of the clients. I mean, one person can't possibly uh, call up and talk to every single one of their client, the clients and, pro and provide a uh, personalized recommendation based on their portfolio and history. So that's where we're going to use the machine to do that. Um, it doesn't replace the uh, uh, the human advisor, which we're calling a bionic advisor here. The bionic advisor is someone who, uh, a human who uses uh, machines to, to do some of the heavy lifting, but then provides additional services and recommendations on top of that. So they are much better than a machine at evaluating someone's risk tolerance and certainly managing uh, emotions which uh, tend to hold sway uh, with personal in investing. And someone mentioned to me that uh, the, the, the future role of a financial advisor is as a uh, psychological advisor. 
So we, we're seeing robo-advisors um, working maybe perhaps uh, completely autonomously for small investors with very simple portfolios. Uh, young people, tech savvy people, some people say it's going to be really popular in Asia with young folks there who are already pretty tech savvy uh, and uh, use computers and, and mobile phones for everything. Whereas uh, human advisors or bionic advisors will be better for large investors who might be older, a little bit less inclined to use their mobile phone for everything. Um, certainly the bulk of the market. I thought this was a good quote from uh, a blog I read. It says that the core of core value of the robo advisory services lies in the automation of back office tasks. Tasks that are mundane and routine, my emphasis, are made more cost and time efficient. It allows the advisors to allocate more time to building and maintaining relationships with their clients. Uh, human touch is crucial in a fully automated wealth management process because it's the behavioral coaching that sets advisors apart from robo-advisors. So again, man plus machine, not machine replacing man. So these are all examples of augmented intelligence. We kind of touched on uh, some of these uh, earlier. Now, I do think there is a place where we'll have autonomous intelligence. Uh, certainly autonomous vehicles uh, may get us there quicker than maybe some of us want. Uh, but in my area, which is business intelligence, I see something really uh, fascinating. Um, and that's uh, time series analytics using uh, autonomous detection, let's call it. I'm starting to see these tools that can go out there at scale in real time and detect anomalies on tens of thousands of KPIs in your organization, not just one or two, but you know, take, take sales or revenue uh, and then all the dimensions and hierarchies of which you can cut sales and revenue, which could be thousands of KPIs and then track those over time uh, and using machine learning, uh, you know, the, uh, these tools can, can start to understand the variability um, uh, and seasonality uh, of the performance of these, of these metrics and KPIs and can then detect when there's an aberration from that, that, that pattern and notify you. Uh, and that's what they do today. That's all we're seeing today. But the next step is to provide uh, apply additional machine learning uh, algorithms uh, once an anomaly is detected to determine, well, why was, what, what caused it? Uh, what was the root cause? Uh, basically to try to find a correlation in the data that might have de um, de determined what that anomaly was. And then once you determine the root cause, you could come up with other machine learning algorithms that would recommend uh, ways to fix it. So remediation. And all this would happen automatically. Uh, and I really think, especially in the world of business intelligence, this, this is the future. This is really powerful. We're starting to see companies use this uh, to manage their operations, especially IT operations. Um, we have uh, a customer um, that did a podcast with us recently that runs a big ad tech farm that's global in nature. And they use this type of technology to to basically monitor uh, the performance of those servers and, and begin to predict before they break down uh, which ones um, they need to attend to. So it's, it's kind of the predictive maintenance type of thing that we're seeing in the manufacturing sector. <clears throat> um, yeah, these are, you know, dimensions of, of metrics. Uh, you can do hundreds of thousands of metrics, uh, monitor them all at once <clears throat> automatically. Um, the next step is to start to take uh, this process and all the history of detection and root cause analysis and remediation and start to do autonomous prediction. So based on what we've seen and done in the past, uh, let's forecast what might happen, what anomalies we might see, uh, begin to model those anomalies uh, in terms of uh, what might be causing them, and, and then uh, figure out how to optimize those processes uh, to avoid this in the future. And a related idea is uh, autonomous analytics, which would be on aggregated usage data, which we're starting to see some support organizations use. So if you can aggregate all the trouble tickets and alerts from all your customers, uh, 
you can start to model uh, what works, what doesn't work in those organizations and begin to predict when they might start to run into troubles. Again, the predictive maintenance type of application. So we can use our intelligence to send alerts uh, about uh, actions that people might want to take now to avoid problems down the road. Yeah, make those recommendations uh, dynamically and in real time. And then also provide benchmarks of how they might be comparing to other folks like them uh, in this field. So with any new and powerful technology, there are benefits and challenges. So with AI, we've mentioned quite a few of these benefits. Uh, uh, it, it can save you time. The machines never sleep. They tend to make fewer mistakes. Uh, they can make humans much more productive. That's the augmented intelligence argument. And if humans are more productive, uh, the company as a whole is going to be more agile, which means it's going to be able to serve customer needs and exploit opportunities faster, as well as save money and generate more value for the company. But there are challenges with AI. Uh, one is that people normally just don't trust the output of a computer uh, when making a, a key decision. Uh, so getting users to trust this uh, artificial output is a huge challenge, especially with more sophisticated AI algorithms like neural networks that you no one really knows how they do what they do. So they're kind of these black boxes. Uh, there's been some movement and some uh, research about how to make those black boxes more open, uh, but still in its infancy. It's something called Lime you might want to look into. Uh, transparency is really all about uh, making the algorithms more transparent, not just to the people who create them, but to, say, consumers or, or customers who, uh, to whom the algorithms are being applied, which might dictate, for instance, a consumer's credit score, whether they get accrued for a loan or not. And in many cases, uh, some of that is regulated. Um, so transparency has to be built into the model building process. Uh, then we have to make sure we apply controls to make sure that the, the algorithms are not drifting uh, and becoming less accurate, that uh, we've eliminated as much bias in those uh, models as possible, uh, and that the algorithm is, is actually doing what it says it's doing. And then finally, it's the fear factor. We've touched on this earlier. People are afraid, and many luminaries have said that uh, AI is going to replace a lot of jobs. But in what I've seen in working with organizations, uh, if it's done properly, uh, and this is ultimately a change management issue more than anything else, uh, if you introduce AI, machine learning, data science properly into an organization, it's going to make people happier because it's going to make them more productive, more effective for the organization. So ultimately, uh, we need to balance the benefits and the challenges, and every organization is going to have a, a, a different weight here. So in conclusion, uh, my uh, hypothesis here is that AI is powerful new automation technology. It's going to help automate routine operations, take some of the drudgery uh, and cost out of manual repetitive tasks. Uh, it's going to improve worker productivity and insights. I don't think AI will replace humans, only repetitive routinized jobs, which, to be honest, most humans don't like and want anyway. Uh, it will require people to maybe upgrade their skills uh, in certain areas. Uh, it's not going to eliminate all jobs. Uh, even if we have, say, autonomous trucks running in caravans of three or four trucks, you still going to need drivers in them uh, you know, maybe two drivers instead of six, right? So uh, there's still going to be jobs. Uh, and then obviously we're going to create jobs to create the robots, uh, manage the algorithms, uh, ensure that uh, proper controls. So ultimately, uh, AI won't replace humans. I think it will mostly augment human intelligence. This is the history of automation over time. Humans will uh, handle exceptions. Uh, things that are fairly complex, um, strategic, future-oriented decisions. That's where humans will really excel. But that being said, AI is designed to learn, right? This is one of the its characteristics that's human-like. It will get smarter. 
uh, as it learns an environment and all the variables and complexities of that environment, it will start to make better and better recommendations. Um, the one I, the, the AI I like right now is I just turned this AI on in Google Mail, Gmail, where it basically wants to complete my sentences. And, you know, most of the time it's actually pretty good. And I, I take its suggestions in real time, just hit the tab button and it completes my sentence. I'm, I'm pretty amazed it, it does as good a job as, as it can. But, uh, and it's a fairly non-intrusive type of thing. Um, but since I think life and business is messy and, and things are always changing, uh, I think <laughs> we're always going to be at odds with these machines. You know, I can imagine a, a future where we have a, a real robot, right? You know, that looks kind of humanoid <laughs> that is designed to say, sit with elderly people who are lonely and give them companionship. We already have robots that can do this, by the way, that detect human emotion and respond accordingly. But I also imagine a scenario where the grandkids come over with a new pet dog, right? And all of a sudden the dog, dog's barking in the background and the elderly person gets upset and mad and the robot, robot jumps in and say, I, you know, I, I see you're upset, is there anything I can do? And you know, people end up um, just saying, shut that thing off. And I know a lot of people, for instance, uh, including myself, have shut off our uh, series in Alexis because it's kind of annoying because it doesn't quite get what we're trying to do or what we're confronting. So I think that's always going to be the case. Um, I think things will, I think these machines will continually to get smarter and smarter. But, you know, life has a way of intervening. Um, and I'm not going to be the first one to drive in an autonomous vehicle unless it's a very clear day on a route that uh, the vehicle has driven, you know, a thousand times before. <laughs> I don't want to take any back roads. Uh, uh, I don't want to have any, introduce any additional variables um, because frankly, I'm a pretty safe driver. So why would I want to increase my risk with an autonomous vehicle, at least, at least in its inception? If you're not a safe driver, then an autonomous vehicle actually might be a better bet for you. So uh, everyone's going to have to make up their own mind about these AI capabilities, whether it's in your personal life or in your, your, your working profession. So with that, I will turn it back to uh, Remy, and we can take a few questions. Wayne, thank you so much. And we're going to take uh, a few questions. And everyone's encouraged to ask a question if they would like in the questions panel on the right. Um, our first question is, uh, Wayne, what is the fastest way for companies to get started with an AI project? Yeah, that, that, that's that's a good question. Everyone wants to jump on this bandwagon uh, very quickly. I, I think the first thing you need to, to do is step back and say, hey, are we just chasing a silver bullet here? Or is there a real business case that, that we have that would make use of this technology? So that's why I tried early on to talk about what constitutes a good use case. Uh, so, you know, you have the right data, it's clean data, it's deep data, uh, you have a business constraint, um, and um, you have uh, the knowledge about how to implement it. So uh, I think you have to do, uh, before you jump on the bandwagon, do a little bit of self-assessment, uh, understand what the opportunities are, uh, and then make sure you um, it, you know, this is a craft as much as a science, uh, the art of creating these analytical models. Uh, and that's actually the easy part. Um, it, it's easy to hire a few data scientists, bring them in, solve a few problems, <laughs> create a few models. The hardest part is actually uh, putting those models into production or adopting the results of those models. M maybe don't put them into production. Maybe just say, hey, well, that was an interesting pattern that you discovered. Maybe we should change the way we do business this way. Uh, but changing business is really hard. Uh, or taking a model like a recommendation engine and embedding it into a customer facing application, that's really hard work. Um, and that requires your analytics group to kind of work closely with your develop application development group, which works closely with your operations team and coordinating all those folks uh, and getting something that uh, delivers real value and continues to deliver real value because it's updated and maintained, that's hard work. 
So don't un underestimate the, the challenges and the work required to make use of this technology and get real value out of it. Okay. We have uh, another one. This is uh, more on the tech side, but uh, we've seen chatbots like Bank of America's Erica. What is an example? What is another example of an interesting FinServe AI use case that you've seen? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the chatbots are interesting. Uh, uh, I was I was communicating with a chatbot once who was trying to schedule a meeting with me, and I and I got so frustrated with it because it. I threw it a curveball and I didn't know how to handle it. And, and it, it, it kept going back to, to square one. And uh, um, so, I, you know, all these things will take time to sort out. Uh, I mentioned robo advisors. That's, that's the one you hear about a lot and, and robotic process control uh, in financial services. We've had quite a bit already with fraud detection, risk management, um, <clears throat> you know, automatic trading, uh, but, to be honest, the use cases are pretty endless. Anytime you've got data uh, uh, and a business constraint uh, and some know-how, um, you'll you'll find ways to to optimize uh, a, a process um, to save money, save time, uh, increase customer satisfaction. Okay. We have uh, another question about use case. Um, this one is: I work in the internal audit space. And I've been using analytics tools for years and to find what I'm looking for. How can we use AI to find risk indicators that we don't even know how to look for? Uh, do you know of anyone even doing this? Huh. Sounds like a deep, deep machine learning question. Yeah, I don't know of anyone doing it, but it can be done, right? This, as long as there's a history of risk factors, right? That people have found in the past, it can start to build up a library essentially uh, and can begin to detect not just exact replicas of, of those incidents, but things like it. So I would imagine there, there would be a market for that. Um, you know, what a great use of uh, AI to, to help people ferret through mounds and mounds of, of information um, that can be kind of opaque. In fact, I just had someone call me uh, yesterday and, and tell me about a new AI-based research service. So I'm, I'm a researcher as well as a consultant. So I, I have to go research new topics like this one <laughs> and sort through thousands of, well, that's the problem. I can only sort through maybe a dozen documents, but this guy was saying, you know, with machine learning, we can sort through thousands of documents and present to you the ones that are most likely to serve your needs. So that's, you know, doing the heavy lifting, like what this audit application might be, is a perfect use case for AI. And if someone's not doing it yet, they, you know, that's a huge opportunity for someone. Yeah, I know about one with JP Morgan Chase. Uh, they developed, a, it's called COIN, Contract Intelligence Platform, and it analyzes legal documents to extract data points and clauses. Um, and uh, it saves them quite a bit of time to do that. So um, wh whoever asked that question, we could take that offline and uh, we can chat about that more. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, what do you see, Wayne, as the biggest roadblock to the adoption of AI? And this is a adoption of AI, I'm assuming, in a company. Well, a lot of people have made hay about the, the lack of skilled data scientists. You know, they're in high demand, they're expensive. A lot of vendors now trying to help people um, without those skills, do much the same um, work. We call them citizens data scientists, you know, make the tools easier to use. So data analysts can uh, create models. I'm not sure how effective that will be, but we're seeing some interesting progress. I'm actually using machine learning to make machine learning easier, <laughs> automating machine learning. Um, it's actually a pretty interesting um, company called Data Robot that's doing exactly that. Um, you know, and I think probably understanding the limitations of these things is going to be really important. Uh, we got into this financial mess in 2008 because executives uh, relied too heavily and, and never questioned the output of their risk models. Um, these things have limitations. 
you know, a lot of it has to do with the data that you put in there. If you only put five years of data, you're not going to anticipate any black swan events, right? So, uh, and there's there's a lot of other limitations that that you need to understand as well to, to make good use of these. Um, but yeah, I think the question was more about getting started. So it's having know-how um, and it's having the right people. Uh, one effective technique I heard about was, all right, so you bring in a um, data science team with experienced folks. They have to, you have to pair them up with someone on the business side. Um, and the business people have to be as savvy about data science if they're going to get any value out of it. They have to know what it's good for, what its limitations are, how the project projects should be run, uh, what they can expect as output, and what to do with that output. So it's always best to pair, for instance, a experienced data science with a new business manager who's never had any exposure to data science, or vice versa. Um, pair up a very experienced business manager who's done data science projects before with a newbie data scientist. So together they can start to learn uh, um, and accelerate the path to value. Yep, it's not only the uh, technology, uh, most of it is change management and talent and getting the right people in the right seats and uh, getting them in the mindset for AI. And uh, with that, Wayne, I think we're all out of time. Everybody, thank you for coming. Wayne, thank you for an insightful presentation. And uh, we'll mail it out to everybody as uh, soon as we get it processed. Again, thank you, everybody.